that have spent um, pretty much my whole academic career claiming that who lives around you has extremely important consequences. So it wasn't a surprise to me when um, after I spent my first winter in Cambridge and had a severe snowstorm and a giant tree branch fell in the middle of the street, um, when I looked outside, um, I saw uh, Barry Bluestone out there trying to clear it from the street. Um, and upon going out and trying to help, um, I was lucky enough to strike up a friendship and was invited to come here and speak to you. Um, so it was, a, uh, it, it, was a ha it was a happy coincidence, I suppose. Um, I'm going to talk, with, I'm going to start with something very similar to what Barry showed you and something that's very exciting for people like me that um, really, really wait for that moment in 2010 when the new census comes out. This is a picture of the whole country and the demographic change by county between 2005 and 2009, particularly using the American Community Survey study. So going from, from particularly 2000 to 2009 in this case. As we saw at Barry's presentation, the lighter counties are the ones that experienced even negative or small population gain. And the really dark counties are the counties that experienced a large positive gain. And if we look at the big picture of this, we can definitely see a movement of population relatively from the Northeast and the Midwest to places like the Southwest and the South. And like everything in this country, when we see movements like that, we try to interpret it politically. And as soon as this data came out, we started to see that. And we can see some of the reactions of stuff like that. So Real Clear Politics, one of the many political websites that out there told us this. They said, the new population count may complicate Obama 2012 bid. The 2010 census report coming out Tuesday will include a boatload of good news, political news for Republicans, and grim data for Democrats hoping to reelect President Barack Obama and rebound from last month's devastating elections. We can see why that might be, right? Places like Arizona, Texas, the reddest of the red states, places like Utah saw population gains, and as Barry mentioned, that means when the redistricting happens, they'll likely, well, they'll certainly gain seats in Congress, and the assumption is because they have more population there in the red states, that that will mean more Republicans in Congress. Of course, there's different interpretations of that kind of thing. Almost as soon as that came out, somebody pointed out, well, it just so happens these places move people that are growing in population, as we very clearly saw in the reddest of red states, happen to be Latinos. And so we said, don't look now, but Texas is turning blue. Not today, to be sure, not, nor tomorrow. But to read the newly released census data on the Lone Star State is to understand that Texas, the linchpin of any Republican electoral college majority, is turning Latino. Unless the Republicans change their spots, Democratic. So what I'm going to tell you, though, is that I think both these interpretations are wrong. Or at least they're reading beyond what we can actually tell from the data. And the reason is, is because they're making a mistake that we often make when we talk about demography. And that is that we assume demography has to do with only who you are and where you live. But as I argue in a lot of my work, more importantly, or at least equally important, is who you're living around. And that has to change when people are moving. And as we can see, when that changes, politics can have very sudden changes. And the composition of our political parties can change very suddenly. This is something I love to show undergraduates who didn't live through it, and they only remember one election ago. <laughs> they were very excited in 2008. I was in Los Angeles at the time, and the UCLA undergrads, as good liberals, were very excited when Barack Obama won. And I said, well, let's not get too excited. The future may not have changed yet. Let's look at 1964, when the very liberal Lyndon Johnson defeated Barry Goldwater. And then let's look at what happened only four years later in 1968 when a sea of red changed. And then, if you want to get real depressed if you're an undergrad, you look at what happened in 1972, <laughs> when the very liberal McGovern <laughs> lost to Richard Nixon. And what I'm going to try to do is use this as an example, going back in time, between 1964 and 1972 to suggest that there was a huge demographic change going on at that time that might possibly be analogous to what we see now. And it might inform us for at least some things that 
we won't know for sure how they're gonna change politics in this country, but we have to at least consider them and consider how these interpretations of, oh, Texas is gonna be red because it's got more people, or, oh, Texas is gonna be blue because it's got more Latinos, might not be so clear. So, what we're gonna ask then is if, going from 2008, what we can say about what might happen in 2012 and what might happen in 2016. And here are some ideas about that, okay? Um, how did we get to this in 1972? Well, it wasn't pretty for the Democrats at the time. And we can see that. We saw a huge decline in Democratic voter registration among white voters, that being the blue line up there. It hit its peak right around that time of Lyndon Johnson and then went into a sharp decline. And in some ways, the Democratic Party has never recovered from that. And so the question is, why did it happen right then? Why did this New Deal coalition that Franklin Roosevelt had put together in the 1930s that banded together all kinds of different white voters, including the white working class, northeastern white liberals, and put them together with white southerners that had very little in common with them? And not only that, but included African Americans, the very people that those white southerners were trying to oppress, how did he keep them all together and how did it all of a sudden fall apart in the 1960s when those Democrats, those white Democrats, suddenly changed parties? Well, if you're me, you say it has something to do with this. This is Los Angeles County um, where I spent uh, a somewhat significant portion of my life in 1950. The shading is by race and ethnic groups, and we saw some of these in the census. The, the plain sort of tan color you see everywhere there is what in 1960 they're labeling as majority Anglo. And you can see it's almost the whole county. And we have this little tiny spot right there next to that dark downtown word in the middle. We have this little tiny spot that's that sort of green, olive green color, and that was the majority black population in LA County in 1950. And then if we look by 1960, only 10 years later, we can look what happened to that black population. And what we saw is a city in particular where that, where that sort of olive green spot is now, that's now the majority black population. We saw a city that now, in the popular consciousness, we think of as almost the most African-American of African-American cities, which is Compton. We saw a city that in 1950 was a majority white city suddenly become a majority black city in less than 10 years. And I'll show you later on what's happened to that city now. But what I'm gonna to argue to you, and what I think we have a lot of evidence for, is what we saw happen at that time in California and in other places, was these white voters that live there next to these places like Compton, all of a sudden changed their politics dramatically. And what happened to them is they not only, as we know, picked up and moved to the suburbs, but they changed their politics. To get to, that, to get to that point, to argue that they changed their politics, we have to go way back in history. And we have to look at what happens, at least what we think happens, when different political groups come together. So this is a map made by a very famous Harvard political scientist named V.O. Key. And V.O. Key studied the South in the 1940s and wrote a book that um, you know, we still make undergraduates read in political science classes. And what he pointed out, and this was a really, a really insightful thing that he pointed out, he said one of the best ways to predict how white voters are going to vote in the South is to look and see how many blacks live in their county. And he knew how they were voting because it was easy at the time because whites were the only ones that could vote. He didn't need survey data. He didn't need to do exit polls. He didn't need anything. He just needed to look at the election returns. The only people that were voting in that counties at the time were white, so he knew how they were voting. And what he did, like with maps like this, is he simply pointed out, he said, look at the counties that have the highest proportion African American. Those are the same counties where we not only see the highest proportion white turnout, but we see the whites voting for the most conservative Democratic candidates. At the time, it was only a contest between Democrats. You had conservative Democrats and you had not so conservative Democrats. And the conservative Democrats were the ones that were arguing most fervently for segregation. And V.O. Key said, look at these candidates with the most blacks. That's where the whites are most voting 
mostly for segregation, these segregationist candidates. And the idea was, Key's idea was, that these white candidates, or these white voters, were what he referred to as threatened by African Americans. He said they had an interest in maintaining some sort of white supremacy. They had an interest in maintaining their dominant political and economic situation. And therefore, they were going to do two things. They were going to turn out to the polls and make sure they voted for that politically. And they were going to make sure, when they did turn out for the polls to vote, that they voted for very conservative candidates. When you show this to people now, they often say, well, that was just a southern phenomenon. That was a strange thing that happened in the south, where people had internalized these racial attitudes. And what shocked a lot of people is this evidence for behavior like this never seems to go away. And it might have been the key point out something that was not only relevant to the South, not only relevant to Alabama, but was relevant to the entire country. So we can move forward. We can move forward about 30 years. And I think we can move forward about 30 years when they started to ask questions like this on surveys and said, simple question, are civil rights being pushed too fast? And if you asked white voters that in 1964 and 1968, a pretty large majority said yes. And if we look at the context of how voters were behaving when they're answering questions like this, we see them acting pretty similarly to these voters in Alabama in the 1930s at the time Key was studying them. One of the best examples is Chicago in 1966. I love this as an example. The, guy, the gentleman on, I guess that's your left, the gentleman on the left is Paul Douglas. He became a liberal senator from Illinois, one of the biggest champions of civil rights. He was a war hero. He was a liberal Democrat. He had it all rolled into one. He was a great political candidate. And in 1960 in Chicago, you could see him sweep that city through the Democratic machine. And the white wars in Chicago, the black wars, he carried them all. Down there in the bottom of that Chicago map, the sort of southwestern corner, the heavily working class white ethnically Irish districts, he carried those, and he carried them heavily. But then between 1960 and 1966, a lot of stuff happened in Chicago. Martin Luther King came there. He put on civil rights marches, arguing for uh, that civil rights included the alleviation of hunger, not only, the, not only for civil rights in the voting sense, but for civil rights in the economic sense. You saw riots in Chicago that were described as racial riots. And then when Paul Douglas ran for re-election in 1966, the journalist Tom Edsel, Thomas Edsel does a great job of documenting this. When Paul Douglas ran for re-election in 1966, what you saw happen was him lose to a conservative Republican, Charles Percy. And his heaviest losses were in these white working class districts, right on the edge of what they called the Black Belt of Chicago. <coughs> he went from the champion of those to the loser of those in a, mere, in a mere six years. At the same time, we saw that sweeping change in public opinion about things like civil rights. So maybe it was just the 1960s. Maybe it was the last place we saw what V.O. Key called racial threat going on. But unfortunately, we can fast forward even further. And we'll stay in Chicago here. We'll stay in Chicago. And we can say we can fast forward even, th even further and say, well, do we have more evidence that this might have been going on in very recent history, in the, in the lifespan of my undergraduates. One place we can look, and this is my own work, one place we can look is we can look and say, what happens when we see a sudden demographic change, sort of like when we saw in the 1960s with the influx of African Americans into places like Chicago? What happens when we see a sudden demographic change in times like we do now? Well, one place we saw it was what we call a, sort of a neat natural experiment, was in Chicago when the federal government went through and tore down large public housing projects. Tore them down, scattered the population outside the city. Those are those little green, little green squares up there, are large public housing projects in Chicago. Some of them look like that picture there, the Stateway Gardens. Held somewhere in Chicago something like 25,000 families, almost 100% of whom were African American. Between 2000 and 2004, at least 13 of these projects were torn down. And the funny thing about Chicago, they ended up looking like that, by the way. The funny thing about Chicago had this interesting racial geography that made this idea of Key's racial threat, of whether people are threatened by the population living around them. It gave a wonderful opportunity to study that. Because in Chicago, you had housing projects. And this isn't true in a lot of cities. You had housing projects that were essentially African-American phenomenon. You had them 
very close to, to census tracts and neighborhoods that are almost 100% white. We can see that if you look at this funny looking little red square on the left hand side, on the left hand side, it's easy to get turned around when you're up here looking from left to right. And on, the le on your left, or, well I'm sorry, that's going to be your right hand side. If we look at the, you know what I'm saying. If we look at the red square on the right hand side, if we look at the, the red square up there, that's the Cabrini Green housing project, one of the most notorious housing projects in all the United States. It's been documented, written about. And what we saw, what we see is the census tracts around it shaded by the percent African American in those census tracts. So the census tracts just to the north of it were almost 100% white. A lot of them were what was known as the Gold Coast, one of the richest neighborhoods in the United States. So now we're moving out of the poor rural south in the 1930s into affluent white neighborhoods just less than 10 years ago. And what we saw after these housing projects were torn down and these African American residents were removed, we saw that the voting behavior of those white residents in those tracks around Cabrini Green and other housing projects changed dramatically. Not only did they stop voting, not literally, I mean they kept voting, but their voting participation stopped, fell by about 12 percentage points, which is a massive amount. So somehow, after all the African Americans left, these white voters said, well, I guess voting is not as important to me anymore. Maybe they weren't threatened by something. And we saw, this one will get you, their propensity to vote Republican dropped dramatically as well. So they went from, in a Democratic city like Chicago, voters that were fairly likely by Chicago standards to vote for Republicans to voters that went back to the regular Chicago behavior of voting for Democrats. So it seems like even in 2000 and 2004, between 2000 and 2004, we saw behavior consistent with this behavior we saw way back in the 1930s and what we saw in the 1960s when the Democratic Party lost its majority between 1960 and 19, 1964 and 1968. And what we think was going on is that vital Democratic coalition lost these voters that lived in these places that African Americans were moving to. They lost those white voters. And so what I want to look at then is ask, well, what do we see going on today with all of this movement that Barry showed us? What do we see going on today? And might it lead to consequences that are similar to what we saw then? The Democratic Party is actually doing pretty well. Don't worry about that graph I showed you. They have the presidency, right? About 53% of voters in the United States are still registered Democrats among registered voters. Only 38% of those are white. So they picked up a lot of minorities. They picked up those Latinos. But what I'm going to look at is whether we can look at these population shifts and say, well, is that coalition going to hold together? So let's look at some evidence for that. Here's Los Angeles County 1960. Here's Los Angeles County 2000. A lot of the United States looks like this. The wows are probably coming from that sort of what we call that mustard orange, that sort of mustard orange color that's taken over Los Angeles County. If I showed that in 2010, this is 10 years old, if I showed that in 2010, it would look even more mustard orange. And notice the neighborhoods that that mustard orange color is now near. It's now near that olive sort of green color. So what we have, what we have is much like in the 1950s and 1960s, when we saw a situation of African Americans moving near the neighborhoods of working class whites, we now see Latinos moving near the neighborhoods of that same vital part of the Democratic coalition, working class African Americans. So what's going to happen? Let's look at, actually, let me look at a little more evidence of this. Let's just look and see what that looks like in a little more detail. So this is a, this is a plot of segregation. This is a plot of segregation. Um, what well, some we might refer to as isolation. And you've been, if you've been coming here and you've been talking about demography, maybe somebody else talked about this. So the isolation of African Americans, essentially how many other African Americans live in their neighborhood in the United States moving from 1890 to 2000. As we can see, right in that period I was talking about, right around 1950, you can look at either line if you want to, but right around 1950, the isolation, meaning that how, many, how isolated African Americans were within their own census tracts, peaked in the United States. About, at about 60%, your average African American in the United States was in a neighborhood that was 60% other African Americans. And they do a thing where they weight that for the population of the city to try to make it a more representative measure. And, and then we saw a rapid decline, kind of rapid. One thing to keep in mind about this is even at that peak though, even at that peak, African Americans, your average white in the United States 
lived in a neighborhood that was no more than 4% African American. Okay. So they were exposed. We call that a measure of exposure. Your average white had a measure of exposure to blacks that was only about 4 out of 100. Okay. To give you a sort of sense of what that is, I wrote this down. In Boston, let me see if I got this right. In Boston now, in Boston now, your average neighborhood that a white person lives in is 85% white. So the average census tract, usually about 6,000 people. And the average exposure to blacks is 3.5. So in Boston, the average white person is exposed to about 3.5 African Americans in their neighborhood. Now here's the nice thing about segregation, though. We have new data on this, too. And we can see this percent of whites and whites tracts is declining. That's why I say it's nice. A lot of good things come out of integration. And we can see the same thing is happening in African American tracks. We see the steady decline, not hugely large, but a steady decline moving between 1980 and about 2010. A decline in the segregation of African Americans and whites. Here's the depressing part about this, though. It's not because African Americans and whites are integrating with each other. It's due to this, and I'm going to take this white blacks and whites tracks line away. That's the, number, that's the average number of blacks and a white. That's the number of blacks in your average white person census tract in the United States. You can see it never got, a, it's not getting much above 10%. What we see though is this. We see, for example, the segregation of Hispanics is increasing. There's more and more Hispanics in your average Hispanic census tract. But on top of that, just due to the increase in population, this is what we see. And here's the part that I think is politically important. Why are, are African Americans desegregating is not because whites are moving into their neighborhoods. It's because Hispanics are moving into their neighborhoods. Very similar to what we saw in the 1960s. On a smaller scale, but they're still there, we see Hispanics moving into white neighborhoods. So we see a starting a, de a demographic mixture in these working class neighborhoods throughout the United States. So what we can ask then, this is where I started to ask before I got to my segregation measures, is do we have any evidence of what this is going to do for the current Democratic majority? And we don't know for sure how something like this is going to affect things, but let me make a few suggestions. How am I doing on a time, Barry? Am I great? Lots of, Lots of time. Great. All right. Let me make a few suggestions. So this is some data from my own research. We don't really know, but I want to show you some few suggestions of why this might be bad for the Democratic majority. There's some evidence that what's going on with this influx of Latinos into African-American neighborhoods could lead to problems like we saw for the Democratic Coalition in 1960 when we saw an influx of blacks into the white working class neighborhoods. We see behavior that is inconsistent with people wanting to stay in the same party. Here's one example. These are maps of demographics and votes in Los Angeles. A lot of the stuff you can see today comes from Los Angeles in the 2008 primary election. The one, the nice sort of uh, orangish colored one there, our voting precincts colored by the oh, our voting precincts colored by the proportion Latino. The darker the precinct, the more Latinos that live there. The map in the middle are voting precincts colored by the proportion African American. The darker the the darker the precinct there, the more African Americans that live there. And that's that same cluster you saw in over and over again. That cluster around places like Compton and Watts and Inglewood, some famous neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Now the map on the the map on the right. Sorry, I'm getting confused again. The red map, the pink map, whatever you want to call it, is the proportion of votes that Obama received in 2008 Democratic primary against Hillary Clinton. Now let me, I think I've got the next slide zooms in on some of these so we can look at this a little more closely. What you can see, that really bright red area, like you'd expect, with a high, high concentration of African Americans, was very pro-Obama voted overwhelmingly for Obama. But as we move eastward, which is going to be that direction, we see the Obama vote become very lightly colored. It almost disappeared. And if we try to look at these maps, if we compare that to this high concentration of Latinos, what we're finding is those Latinos that live right next to that high concentration of African Americans were very unlikely to vote for Barack Obama. As they move further away, their probability of voting for Barack Obama became a lot higher. So one way we might interpret this is to look and say, well, 
it looks like Latinos, when they come into close contact with African Americans, exhibiting some sort of racial threat, some sort of inability to vote for a black candidate, very similar to what we saw among white voters in the 1960s, and what we saw among white voters in the 1930s, and what we saw even in 2000 in places like Chicago. We can look for other evidence. It's hard to get at what people really think about things, so the way we can go about looking for evidence is some other stuff we did in Los Angeles, where we tried to figure out how do these Latino and African American groups that live in close proximity to each other, how do they really feel about each other, and how does that affect their politics? So what we did, one thing we did, was a field experiment. It was an experiment, it actually was, because we randomly assigned people to treatment and control conditions. What we did is we took a letter like this, and I had a map embedded to it, and I sent it to African American and Latino voters in Los Angeles. And on that map, it pointed to their own neighborhood, and it pointed to another neighborhood nearby, and it told you how often, if you were the letter recipient, how often you had voted. Sorry, should be clear about that. How often the people in your neighborhood had voted. And then it pointed to another neighborhood, and said how often the people in that other neighborhood had voted. It didn't say anything about race. It didn't say anything about Latinos or African Americans or anything like that. It just said how often people were voting. And here's what happened. So like I said, sent it to a block nearby, said how often those people voted in recent elections. Here's what happened. When African Americans received this letter, when they received this letter, if it pointed to a block that was comprised of African Americans, and blocks are usually like that due to the residential segregation, a block can be almost entirely African American, there can be another block right next door that's almost entirely Latino. If it pointed to a block that was almost entirely African American, that letter had no effect. It didn't really do anything. Who knows what they did with it? You know, they might have voted, they might not have. I don't know. But what we did is we sent it to them, and then we looked and saw how that affected their voting in the next election. And when African Americans got that letter, and it compared them to a Latino block, remember, it didn't say anything about them being Latinos. It just said, look at this block nearby. Look how often they're voting. In the next election, those African Americans that received that letter were far more likely to vote. And so one way to interpret this is that the African Americans that are receiving that letter in a, racially, a neighborhood that's racially changing are very aware of who's living around them. And they're feeling some sort of political competition with this new incoming group. They don't even have anybody to explicitly tell them about it. They just have to point to a map like I did, sort of a virtual pointing through a letter I sent them, point to a map and say, that group is voting more than you are and it turned people out to vote. Sort of like we saw in Alabama in the 1930s. Okay, so a couple things here just to wrap up on this. Um, the last couple things I showed you are some evidence that I interpret to say this coalition between African Americans and Latinos and a smaller and smaller proportion of whites could be sort of uncomfortable. It could be people are going to experience some kind of conflict, and that might drive them out of this party. Well, one way we can look at that is just try to ask people their opinions on things directly. And this is what I'm going to show you now. It's not so clear that that's what's going to happen. One way we can measure opinions about, for example, things, uh, opinions about Latinos is to look at things about survey data about immigration. So the problem with surveys, you can never just ask people directly how they feel about a group. You can't make a list and say, how many of these groups do you hate, or something like that, because people will never answer honestly. Right? So that's why in the 1960s they had to ask questions like, are people pushing too fast on civil rights? Your answer to that, it could reflect a lot of things, but it probably reflected something about your opinions about African Americans. And it's safe to say in some ways, not for everybody, but in some ways your opinions about what you think about immigration has something to do with your core values about diversity and about Latinos. So you can ask all kinds of questions. This is from something called the Cooperative Campaign Election Study. Cooperative Congressional Election Study, I should be careful about that, which is some of those wonderful new surveys that political scientists can use, where it's over the internet now, so we have tens of thousands of cases. And because of that, they actually get good samples of people's like, people like African Americans and Latinos. On old surveys, we never used to have good samples of them, and they didn't have good statistical properties. They go over the internet now, and they ask questions like this. What do you think Congress and the President should do about immigration? Well, one thing you could do is grant legal status to all illegal immigrants who have held jobs and paid taxes for the, at least three years and not been convicted of any felony crimes. That happened in, we asked this question in, um, we asked this question in 2010. And what we see is the number, of, the number of people that are answering yes to this question is really more driven by party than by ethnicity. Okay? 
And in some ways, there's a gap. There's a gap. But in a lot of ways, the majority of Democratic whites and the majority of Democratic African Americans are willing to say, yes, I think you should grant legal status, I think you should grant citizenship to those immigrants. Right? Of course, you could look at the other way and say there's a 19 point gap between Hispanics and blacks in the Democratic Party. 19 get points is a pretty large gap in one party. So you can interpret that different ways, but it's not overwhelming. Okay? Another one. This is something Barry referred to, these immigration laws in Arizona. They said, allow police to question anyone they think may be in the country illegally. Different ways to think about this. There's a huge split between Democrats and Republicans. So parties doing a lot of this work. But black and white Democrats are more than twice as likely than Latinos to say they think the police should be able to do this, even in the Democratic Party. So there is some sort of a racial split here. Whether those issues will drive immigration or not, I mean drive politics or not, it's hard to say. But in some ways, we think they have to be resolved. Okay. Last bit, and I skipped over another bit of focus group evidence I had on this. And I just like to, I like to do this because I like to change, uh, end these things on a somewhat positive note. Because a lot of people in Boston don't want to hear about the fracturing of the Democratic Party. Right? <laughs> Barry and I discussed this last, uh, when we had coffee a while back about whether demography is truly destiny. And I think sometimes destiny is supposed to mean something that's inescapable. Right? So maybe it's wrong for me to say it's not destiny, but it's, it is destiny, but maybe not deterministically. Because in social science, we never have things that are deterministic. It's always about probability. And it could be what's going to change this is just that, well, it's hard for us to predict what happens when people get together and when they're neighbors and things like that and when they actually meet people and they get along. And one way I tried to study that was back in 2009, I sat with African-American voters in Los Angeles in Crenshaw, which is a historically African-American neighborhood that is turning over to a Latino neighborhood, much like Compton is and Watts is and neighborhoods like that. And I asked them what they thought about their Latino neighborhoods. And you had a lot of opinions about why people voted, and a lot of people said, I vote because of immigration. I'm threatened by that. People openly said that among African Americans. But in the end, and this is what I want to close on, we had a lot of comments like this. People said things like this. They said, I have a lot of Latino friends. They're on my street, in the neighborhood. We tend to get along. We barbecue together. We party together. And in some ways, maybe that, coming together of people, is what's going to shape national politics as we move forward. All right. Thank you.